What's up guys? Today I am ill, <laughs> but the show must go on because I've got board exams coming up and you've got board exams coming up. So without further ado, we're going to be doing financial assets today. So I've changed the presentation from a Wacom pen to an actual PowerPoint. The reason being is I keep borrowing my sister's Wacom pen and I'm moving soon. And I found out how much I'm earning next year as a trainee. And um, long story short, I just won't have any disposable income to be spending on my own pen. So now we are basically going to have to mix it up a bit. Cool. So when doing financial assets, I'm going to kind of go through the formula of the definition, the classification, the reclassification, impairment, modification, and write-offs. And I think if you flag your IFRS 9 as such, you'll be fine because that covers everything you'd ever need to know for financial assets. So first things first, what is a financial asset? And this definition is found in IAS 32 paragraph 11, and it is being cash, an equity instrument of another entity, a contractual right to either receive cash or another asset, or to exchange financial instruments under favorable conditions for us, and lastly, a contract settled in the entity's own shares. That last point has a bunch of conditions attached to it, so maybe you want to go check that out. It's to do with non-derivatives and derivatives and whatever, but I won't go into it. So basically, the idea of a financial asset is that you have some sort of contractual rights or ownership attached to this asset. Next, we're going to be going into how do we treat a financial asset and this will be looking at the classification of the financial asset. So they can be measured in four different ways. This depends on the entity's business model. How do we expect the entity to deal or manage or derive any returns from this financial asset? Do they want to hold on to the asset and just collect contractual cash flows, i.e. those cash flows that are signed in the contract that the entity will be receiving? Do they want to hold on to them and collect cash flows but maybe in the future sell this asset for profit or something else? Do they want to maybe use this asset for trading purposes. So depending on the business model that the entity has chosen for this particular financial asset, the treatment of the financial asset will differ. So as mentioned, there are four different ways of measuring and the first being at amortized cost. And we've seen amortized costs before with financial liabilities, you know, with an amortization table and you accrue interest, you subtract payments and you get your net carrying amount and that sort of thing. Same principle here, except we accrue interest income and we will deduct payments that we will receive. These are the contractual cash flows. Your financial asset will be measured at amortized cost when the business is to collect cash flows only. And these cash flows consist of principal and interest solely. And the next method is measuring it at fair value through OCI on the combined model. And this is where the business model is to collect contractual cash flows and sell the asset. So hence the combined sort of vibe. But the trick here is it's not as simple as adjusting the fair value for the changes and then sending it through OCI. You're firstly going to calculate the financial asset using the amortized cost method and then adjust that carrying amount to the new fair value and measure that through OCI. The third method is fair value through profit and loss. And this is where this financial asset doesn't fit into the criteria of either one or two. So it's not on a combined model and it's not using amortized cost. So for example, if your intention was only to trade this financial asset, most likely it would be fair value through profit or loss. And there you just recognize changes. The exception to this is that you may have an irrevocable election to measure at fair value through OCI. And this is number four. And this is where an entity holds another equity instrument and has made the decision to recognize changes in that instrument through OCI rather than through profit or loss. Note that this decision cannot be made if the sole purpose is to trade the financial asset, but for more guidance, see IFRS 9 paragraph 5.7.5. So when thinking about the recognition of a financial asset, you need to keep in mind two things. Firstly, what is the entity's business model? And secondly, are the cash flows contractual and do they consist solely of interest and the principal amount? As this will dictate which measurement tool you'll be using. Next, we look at reclassification. And IFRS 9.4.4.1 says this is when and only when an entity changes its business model. So for example, if you were on fair value through OCI and suddenly your intention changes to sell this asset only and you change to fair value through profit and loss, you have a reclassification. Let's say you have a financial asset measured on the combined model, so it's fair value through OCI but combined, and you sell this asset, therefore your intention has changed to trade, you will be reclassifying that OCI into profit and loss, so i.e. reversing the cumulative OCI gains or losses and transferring it to profit and loss. And you'll see this come up when we have a two-statement approach where the OCI section of the statement is items that may be reclassified and items that may not re be reclassified. And now you know that items on the combined model may be reclassified to profit and loss. And importantly, and I had no idea before studying this for this video, 
these reclassifications will only occur in the following period. So if in X1 I discovered that my business model had changed, then only in X2 will there be a reclassification. Now let's move on to impairment of a financial asset. So we know with normal assets, an impairment happens when our carrying amount exceeds our recoverable amount. But how do we know when a financial asset is going to be impaired? Firstly, we must keep in mind which financial assets can this apply to, and these are the assets measured at either amortized cost or on the combined model. So the measurement method is the expected credit loss method. So an expected credit loss is saying how much did the contract say we were going to receive, how much do we actually expect to receive, and what is the difference? And the difference is the expected credit loss or the shortfall. So for example, if our contract says we were meant to receive 100 Rand monthly, but actually we expect to only receive 80 Rand monthly, we know our shortfall is 20 Rand. And obviously the method of calculating this expected credit losses is a bit different because you take into account probability of default and time value of money and all that, but I'll get to it. And as mentioned before, the impairment model only works for financial assets measured at amortized cost or on the combined model. And this is because they're the only ones that have contractual cash flows. Whereas with the other two, the fair value through profit and loss and the fair value through OCI and the irrevocable election, you don't account for impairment losses because the changes in the value of those assets are adjusted with the changes in the fair value. And the other thing is, unlike other impairment standards, there doesn't need to be this objective evidence of impairment. So there doesn't need to be a default event or anything like that. You will always be recognizing these credit losses where applicable. In the case where there is objective evidence of a default, such as maybe the debtor declared bankruptcy or something like that, then this financial asset is said to be credit impaired and this will have later implications. Now let's just chat about how we would go about measuring the actual impairment loss or the expected credit loss. The general approach to the expected credit loss model is to say, has there been a significant increase in the credit risk? i.e. has it become very likely that the debtor will default on their payments. If you see that there has been a significant increase in credit loss, then you're going to be using the lifetime expected credit losses. So the credit losses over the lifetime of this asset that you hold for. If there has not been a significant increase in credit risk, then you're just using the 12 month expected credit losses. So if you think of a timeline, how you will measure the expected credit losses. So that's the general approach and the simplified approach, which applies to trade receivables, contract assets and lease receivables, it usually assumes a lifetime expected credit loss, but there are circumstances where this may or may not be the case. And for further guidance, see paragraph 5.5.15. Now the next question is, well, how do I know if it's a significant increase in credit risk? That kind of seems a bit subjective. Now you'll find a glorious, glorious summary of significant increases in paragraph B5.5.15. You'll look at factors such as market indicators, maybe credit rating downgrades of the debtor, the debtor's operating results. Look at the summary, it's amazing. Basically, it's any factor that leads you to think, okay, this bro is not going to be able to pay me. Now, once you've ascertained whether or not there's been a significant increase in credit risk, and therefore you're using the lifetime expected credit losses or the 12 month expected credit losses, you're going to draw out your timeline and you're going to say, what are my actual contractual cash flows over the certain periods in which I'm supposed to receive cash flows? And what do I predict these cash flows to be? What's the shortfall? And then your present value back to the present time it is now. And that value is going to be your impairment loss. The impairment loss always goes through profit and loss. So it's a debit to impairment loss through profit and loss. And the credit will go to your credit loss allowance account, either a negative asset, so through statement of financial position, or through OCI, and that depends on one of the two business models applicable to impairment, so amortized cost or fair value through OCI on the combined model. Important to note, as you can see, the credit loss allowance account is a negative asset. Therefore, it reduces the gross carrying amount of the financial asset to give you your amortized cost. So your gross carrying amount represents the carrying amount of the financial asset before taking into account any impairment losses. This becomes applicable when you're looking at if something is credit impaired. If something is credit impaired, when calculating your interest income, you will be using your amortized cost. So you will take into account impairment losses. Whereas if something is not credit impaired, i.e. there's not objective evidence of a default, then you're going to be using your gross carrying amount to calculate your interest income. And that's all there is to impairment. So you're looking at, is it a 12 month ECL? Is it a lifetime ECL? And using that information, draw your timeline, calculate what are my shortfalls going to be at each period, discount them using your interest rate, and that's your impairment loss, and send it to your credit loss allowance account either through the statement of financial position or OCI. 
Sorry, I'm using so many fingers. <laughs> the second last thing we cover is modification of cash flows. And that's where there's been a change either in the timing or the amount of cash flows. So for example, where debtor comes to you and is like, okay, I don't want to pay 100 Rand anymore. Can I pay 80 Rand? And therefore there's a modification and you're going to have to adjust the carrying amount of your financial asset. Again, because this is dealing with changes in cash flows, it will only apply to an amortized cost model and the fair value through OCI on combined model because those are the only two options that deal with contractual cash flows. So the method for calculating your modification is you calculate your original gross carrying amount by discounting your original cash flows by the original interest rate. So you calculate original gross carrying amount. Then you're going to calculate your modified gross carrying amount using the modified cash flows at the original interest rate. And your difference there is either a modification gain or loss through profit and loss important and with the debit or credit being to your gross carrying amount of your financial asset and lastly we have a write-off and that's where you absolutely will not be receiving your contractual cash flows and we're going to de-recognize the financial asset we will do this by reversing your gross carrying amount as well as the credit loss allowance account and i think that covers everything fs9 is pretty user-friendly though so i think if you flag in those six sections you should be okay, but definitely have a read through it. Yeah, I just feel like it's a really nice section. Anyways, thanks for watching. Sorry if I sound like a sick person. I absolutely am. I hope you all have a lovely day and happy studying. Good luck to everyone writing stops and the boards. Cool.